Good evening. Again, it's week six of our 16-week webinar series, and we're welcoming you back and appreciate your support. I um, just want to share a vision that we have. When we talk about Sharia Crime Stoppers, another way to look at that is uh, people are familiar with Law & Order, the television show that has a special victims unit. Uh, we would envision a day when, in America, we have revitalized the law enforcement community so that we would actually have the equivalent of law and order Sharia Crimes unit. This would be a unit that's fully trained to deal with citizens that give them clues. Uh, investigators who understand Sharia can prepare a case, can go see a prosecutor. The prosecutor is educated in Sharia uh, and takes the case forward. And finally, in the latter part of, of uh, law and order, you see them in court. Well, in order for court to be successful and for justice to be done, there needs to be a judge who understands Sharia and, of course, a jury who understands Sharia and can react appropriately and make a verdict of innocent or guilty, completely understanding the motivation, if it can be included in the case where the motivation would be Sharia, Sharia-sanctioned crime with justice done. So with that background, tonight we're going to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, a critically important topic, and we'll turn it over to David Boris now. Thank you, Dick, and good evening, everybody, again. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We'll be spending this week and next week talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. Our major takeaways for tonight, we're going to look at the historical overview of the Muslim Brotherhood, the initial publication of its playbook back in 2001 with the tactics to be used for world conquest, how the Muslim Brotherhood is infiltrating into America, the importance of a document referred to as the explanatory memorandum that identifies the strategic plan for eliminating America, followed by the five-phase plan for civilization jihad in the United States. Just to reorient ourselves for tonight's and next week's webinar, we've been discussing the violent axes of jihadist threat, as well as the ideological foundation for it during the past two webinars. Now it's time to refocus our attention on the soft jihad, the axis and focus on the Muslim Brotherhood. It's certainly worth repeating that both of these axes complement each other. While the Muslim Brotherhood is luring us to grant Muslims special privileges, and while they continue to promote censorship about the jihadist threat, the threat of jihad and terrorism looms over all Western countries. There are any number of Muslim Brotherhood members, friends, and supporters who advance the stealth jihad approach. Through nonviolent actions to totally integrate Sharia compliant practices, many of which are criminal, into our culture. Another way to look at this is the old good cop, bad cop approach. As we'll soon see, this is a totally mistaken assessment of the Muslim Brotherhood, who shares the same goals and beliefs as the jihadists. Both groups are equally bad for America. The only differences between the two are their tactics, and which one will be successful first. My money is on the Muslim Brotherhood and their extensive network in America to subvert our way of life and establish Sharia supremacy. And remember, there is an alliance between the Muslim Brotherhood and their entities with the social Marxists and progressives in our country. The logo on the left is the one traditionally associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. It depicts the Quran at the top between two sword blades. And in Arabic, between the two sword handles, the word prepare to make ready. Along with two swords themselves, signifying the need to remove both internal and external threats to Islam through jihad. Please remember from our webinar on jihadist ideology that threats to Islam are called obstacles. Obstacles that stand in the way of fundamentalists to establish Sharia law. Now, the logo on the right first appeared during the pro-Morsi demonstrations in Egypt, symbolizing the death of his followers in Rabia Square on August 14, 2013. The yellow symbolizes the Golden Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, 
with the black hand reflecting the black cloth covering the Kaaba or cube in Mecca. Finally, the number four shows that Morsi was the fourth elected president of Egypt following Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak. The words prepare or make ready are based on Allah's command. Prepare for them or the infidels whatever military power you have to insert fear into the enemies of Allah. Which leads us back to William Federer's RPM model with some minor modifications from the previous one we referenced last week. First, the religious aspects of Islam as practiced by Muhammad in Mecca between 610 and 622, followed by pre-Jihad phase of the Muslim Brotherhood known as Dawah that we'll discuss in detail a little bit later this evening. And don't forget Hudna for temporary truce or ceasefire periods to regroup, all in preparation for jihad or military action. The Muslim Brotherhood even believes that the last and final phase of jihad may not be necessary if dawah or pre-jihad is executed properly. We've had the Muslim Brotherhood's grand playbook since 2001 that reveals a meeting called in 1977 by Josef Nada in Switzerland that established the foundational structure to guide the Muslim Brotherhood in Europe and the United States. This led to a 1982 document called The Project, a 12-point strategy to establish a worldwide Islamic government to rule, rule the world. The project is a long-term endeavor that will take place in phases to invade the culture of the West. Doesn't this sound just like what cultural Marxists do? This invasion is using many tactics from immigration, propaganda, censorship, deception, protest, infiltration, and if necessary, terrorism or jihad. It is a Trojan horse strategy to subvert the Constitution. Some of the tactics of the project. Avoid open alliances with terrorist groups or organizations. Now the operative word is open, so that the Muslim Brotherhood will be viewed as the so-called good cop, as compared to those violent terrorist groups. Just another example of deception. Infiltrate and take control of existing non-Muslim Brotherhood or non-Muslim organizations to focus their efforts and activities on furthering Muslim Brotherhood goals. Followed by creating a network of Islamic schools and charitable organizations that can be used to launder money covertly to jihadist groups. Insert Muslims with fundamentalist beliefs into federal, state, and local governments, non-government organizations, labor unions, school boards, and form partnerships with churches and synagogues. This is huge, the creation of a red-green axis with progressive groups, social Marxists, liberal organizations, not to mention colleges and universities. Keep Muslims fired up by emphasizing their victim status as a persecuted minority and whenever possible get them involved in fostering social and political unrest just short of covert violence. Continue to support jihadist groups through the back door out of public view. Remember the seventh category of zakat that is part of a Muslim's annual financial giving of two and a half percent of their total wealth. Finally, Maintain enmity and hate toward Jews and fake friendships with other non-Muslims. If you had the enemy's playbook, what would you do with it? What would you expect our government officials to do with it? Most of you are familiar with the frog, the parable of the scorpion and the frog. The scorpion asked the frog for a ride on the frog's back to cross the river. Out of kindness, the frog agrees, knowing he risks being stung by the scorpion. Partway across the river, what happens? Just like the scorpion acknowledges his true nature by killing the frog, 
so too our enemy and founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Look at Hassan Banna's words in the top right box. It's the nature of Islam to dominate. It's part of the very fabric or DNA of Islam. And in the bottom box, Islam is about imposing Sharia on mankind. Nowhere is this battle better reflected than in the brothers, Muslim Brotherhood's creed. God is our objective, the Quran is our constitution, the prophet is our leader, jihad is our way, and death for the sake of Allah is the highest of our aspirations. This is still in effect today, still being ignored by so many in our government. Jihadists and members of the Muslim Brotherhood love death and incorporated martyrdom as death for the sake of Allah is the highest of our aspirations. The original form of Islam as practiced by Muhammad and his righteous companions must prevail. Returning again once final time to Saeed Qutb, who called for a revival of Islam to liberate mankind from man-made laws to establish Allah's sovereignty. By doing what? Overpowering all obstacles. Just like jihadists did after Muhammad's death. Finally, Qutb called for a vanguard of highly committed followers to impose Sharia in America. They came to the United States in 1962 the vanguard or cadre of Muslim Brotherhood members came to our shores in phases. Let's look at each phase separately. The initial vanguard came from Egypt in Saudi Arabia in 1962 and consisted of Muslim Brotherhood members who left their guns behind. The first Muslim Brotherhood front group was the Muslim Students Association formed in 1963 at the University of Illinois on the Urbana campus. The next phase of the Muslim Brotherhood members came from Pakistan in 1971 and started the Muslim of America camps we discussed during the current threat webinar earlier this fall. The next contingent came from Palestine during the 1980s and established Islamic Association of Palestine to raise financial support for Hamas. The IAP established chapters or fundraising in colleges and university campuses and would later change its name to the Council of American Islamic Relations. Since 1980, the Muslim Brotherhood has been working to consolidate their efforts and to further expand their influence into all segments of American society. Funding has come from Saudi Arabia for a variety of projects to include mosque and Islamic school construction. Finally, since the mid-1990s, the next wave of Muslim Brotherhood members has come from Somalia and refugee resettlement programs sponsored by the United Nations and administrated by non-governmental organizations in the United States. Earlier in this evening's webinar, we looked at the critical Muslim Brotherhood document called The Project, which established the strategic guide for the growth of political Islam in Europe and the United States. It contained a 12-point strategy to establish a worldwide Islamic caliphate or government, a strategy known to U.S. government officials to, since 2001. A second key document of the Muslim Brotherhood called the Explanatory Memorandum on the General Strategic Goal for the Group in North America came into the hands of the FBI in 2004, prepared by senior Muslim Brotherhood officials from the Islamic Society of North America and the Islamic Council of North America. The document was authored by Mohammed Akram in 1987 and published in 1991. That was nine years following the publishing date of the project document. The Ikhwan must understand that their work in America is a grand jihad in destroying Western civilization from within and to sabotaging its miserable house by their own hands and the hands of believers. The document is prepared by the Muslim Brotherhood leadership for their followers 
and it makes it very clear that the work of the Muslim Brotherhood in America is a grand jihad. To destroy Western civilization by sabotaging its miserable house with the help of non-Muslims in conjunction with Muslim Brotherhood followers. The statement goes on to say, so that America is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to the challenge and not prepared for jihad. In other words, unless the membership of the Muslim Brotherhood clearly understands their marching orders, they are not up to the task, nor are they prepared for jihad. These are clear statements of criminal intent that collectively provide the basis for a criminal conspiracy to subvert the Constitution of the United States. A criminal conspiracy being waged against the United States by the Muslim Brotherhood, its members, affiliates, and sympathizers today. So how do they intend to sabotage our miserable house? By our hands and assistance. First, they, by hiding behind our Constitution and our laws, by counting on ignorance and denial of the threat through their use of deception, by our obsession with tolerance of all others, especially those who claim they've been victimized by racism or hatred, along with our unwillingness to be critical because of political correctness. Another way we help the Muslim Brotherhood is by caving in to their insistence, Muslim privileges and accommodating their efforts to impose Sharia compliant practices. During our first webinar, we saw how effective the Muslim Brotherhood has been to get senior government officials of the Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, and Department of Defense to totally purge and dilute our law enforcement and military's training about the Islamic threat in America. Yet another way we are assisting them is by being totally distracted by and consumed with our quest for pleasure and toys, not to mention by the unholy alliance between the Muslim Brotherhood and the far left and progressives who have social Marxist beliefs, and by direct assistance to declare the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization, which we're unwilling to do, or our unwillingness to prosecute any Muslim Brotherhood entity for violating U.S. laws. And finally, pastors and rabbis seem universally unwilling to protect their flocks by warning them about Sharia. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood has read Sun Tzu and has diagnosed American society, its leadership, and its institutions, and has concluded they know their enemy and they can win. On the other side of the ledger, let's now focus on some of the tactics and activities used by their members against us. One is lawfare or the filing of frivolous civil lawsuits against anyone deemed to be offending Islam in order to force them into silence or inactivity. Such suits are often used to force local law enforcement to cancel training about the Islamic threat, as happened to the Barrow County Georgia Sheriff's Office last March when I was scheduled to give an eight-hour training class. We will address the tactic, this tactic in more detail later. Suffice it to say that demands for special privileges for Muslims are endless and will never stop until local officials stop caving in to Muslim demands. Just the possibility of being called a racist, bigot, or an Islamophobe is often enough to silence any critic of Islam or to force any public official to comply with a Muslim Brotherhood demand. During our second webinar on the current threat, we addressed the use of takfiris as the label to threaten Muslims into silence out of fear of being considered an apostate. The United Nations has passed several resolutions favorable to Sharia at the insistence of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, which is comprised of 57 Muslim nations who constitute the largest voting bloc in the United Nations. Resolutions like 1618 that greatly restrict free speech of member nations to conform to Sharia blasphemy codes in Sharia 
or face criminal sanctions. Yes, the Muslim Brotherhood is often contacted to provide training to law enforcement, Department of Homeland Security, and members of the military. As we saw during the first webinar on the purge, current Department of Homeland Security guidelines frown on using so-called Muslim reformers as trainers while promoting the use of more mainstream and moderate trainers from the Muslim Brotherhood. Unfortunately, far too many of our public officials and members of Congress and the Senate rely on CARE and other Muslim Brotherhood entities for information about Islam. Not only are such officials threatened by being called racist or Islamophobes if they don't listen to the Muslim Brotherhood, they also risk losing valuable campaign contributions from Muslim Brotherhood coffers. And what information these public officials do receive from the Muslim Brotherhood is more often than not wrapped up in one of the various forms of deception, lies, and propaganda we discussed previously. One of the Muslim Brotherhood's more successful campaigns involves their penetration and influence on what is taught in our classrooms. We'll take a closer look at the closer look at this during the next webinar. Another tactic they use has targeted our churches and synagogues by promoting the notion that all worship and the same God, all religions are peaceful, and we can even blend Christianity and Islam into Chrislam as a way to further marginalize the Jews. The explanatory memorandum identifies the Muslim Brotherhood's efforts to impose Islam as a civilization alternative to change America through our political correct desire for tolerance. Through an extensive and elaborate process referred to as settlement, in order to integrate, firmly root, enable, and entrench Sharia into our society in stages. An important aspect of this, of this process, is the expansion of the mosque and Islamic Center network throughout America. Something we'll look at in webinar number 11 entitled Mosques, the Access of Our Movement. Another aspect of settlement is accomplished by increasing the numbers of Muslims in America. Immigration, conversions, refugee resettlement, and higher birth rates are all calculated means to bring this about. Don't make the mistake in assuming settlement means assimilation. On the contrary, Muslims are told not to assimilate, but to live in distinct enclaves where Sharia can rule. Settlement, on the other hand, does imply the one-way street to integrate Sharia practices into mainstream American culture, all involving a well-thought-out plan to dominate America through dawah, or pre-jihad, that we'll discuss later this evening. Now, how do we know all this information? All of the information about the Muslim Brotherhood and explanatory memorandum, plus a whole lot more, is a matter of record in the Holy Land Foundation trial conducted in a federal court with Department of Justice prosecutors with evidence obtained by the FBI. This trial represents the largest illegal transfer of funds, $12.4 million to Hamas. The trial resulted in five convictions on 108 charges, plus the identification of 307 unindicted co-conspirators, including the Council of American Islamic Relations and the Islamic Society of North America, the largest Muslim group in our country. Note that the Department of Justice has not brought any charges against any of the co-conspirators identified during the trial even though the assistant U.S. attorney in Texas wanted to, but was overruled by the Obama administration. Pictured here on the left are the five defendants who were convicted during the trial, resulting in prison terms ranging from 15 to 65 years. Also pictured to the right is Nahad Awad, the current executive director of CARE, a Muslim Brotherhood front group, and the fundraising arm for Hamas. 
Returning to the explanatory memorandum, we see a list of Muslim Brotherhood organizations and affiliates at the time that the memo was prepared in 1987. We see at the top of the list, the Islamic Society of North America, identified as one of the unindicted co-conspirators, followed by the Muslim Student Association, the first Muslim Brotherhood group formed in America back in 1963. And fourth from the bottom, the Islamic Association for Palestine that later morphed into the Council of American Islamic Relations as uncovered by an FBI wiretap of a Muslim Brotherhood meeting held in Philadelphia. The significance of the explanatory memorandum. The evidence presented at the Holy Land Foundation trial clearly establishes a criminal conspiracy by the Muslim Brotherhood to overthrow the United States government and represents a clear, unambiguous statement, statement of criminal intent to subvert the U.S. Constitution. Through evidence uncovered during the trial that was uncontested by the defense. Ever since the Muslim Brotherhood and its officials have engaged in an elaborate subterfuge consisting of denials that Islam has anything to do with terrorism, deceptions over the meaning of key terms and statements like jihad is only an inner struggle against temptation, or by making the repeated argument that Islam is being victimized by the West and has every right, therefore, to defend itself from outside threats, and finally, by outright obstruction and resistance to any counterterrorism programs that even hint at a nexus to Islam, or by continuing to raise funds for Hamas and by preventing any factual discussion about Islam by the aggressive use of ad, ad hominem attacks. Returning to Sun Tzu and the art of war, the opportunity for defeating the enemy is often provided by the enemy himself. Let's now turn to how we're giving the Muslim Brotherhood such an opportunity to defeat us by looking at their plan for victory. We've previously reviewed, previously reviewed two key documents authored by our enemy that provided the strategy behind the quest for victory, the project and the explanatory memorandum. Now we'll turn to the five-phase plan for accomplishing their goal. As we said from the outset, what the Muslim refers to as Grand Jihad consists of two axes, one covert or overt through direct attacks by jihadist groups and the other more co covert and nonviolent. We've also said that both axes complement each other so we'll be focusing on the luring aspect of the equation, also known as dawah or pre-jihad. That if done properly makes the last phase of jihad not even necessary. All the fishermen and women in our audience know the importance of lures, especially the right lure. The Muslim Brotherhood uses a variety of lures to entice or subduce its prey into submission by causing us to let down our guard or to become totally demoralized before we are captured. We can say the same about Dawah, which represents the call to Islam by submitting to our enemy's demands. But is this case, but in this case, the call is not optional. Think of Dawah as a court summons. Every peace officer knows when one is received, you must comply or face the consequences from the judge for noncompliance. The choices we have, according to Sharia, are three. Convert to Islam, submit by agreeing to follow to Sharia rules and pay special poll tax to the Islamic State while being permitted to live in servitude and, humili and humiliation to our Muslim masters, or face death. All the while, Dawah proceeds in phases while the fundamentalists gain in strength and influence and non-Muslims become desensitized as conditions get worse. In short, Dawah gives its intended victim due notice that something truly bad will follow if the warning is not heeded. 
or in their words, an evil morning. A word of caution. The Muslim Brotherhood and their many apologists will assure us that Dawah is nothing more than Islamic outreach or proselytizing, just like other religious followers attempt to do. The truth is, it is a lot more. No other religion attempts to gain followers by terrorizing them into submission. Just look at the degree of violence practiced by jihadists. Or better yet, consider the ceremonial public beheadings, floggings, and amputations still occurring in Saudi Arabia following Friday afternoon prayers. The very same methods used by jihadists when they conquer territory as ISIS did in Iraq and Syria. So Dawah is a warning, a warning. Let's see how Allah discusses the relationship between luring or Dawah and terrorism or jihad. Invite non-believers through beautiful preaching and be gracious in any discussions and arguments. But for those who go astray or are not obedient will be the eventual losers. When we decide to destroy a population, we first send a definite order to those among them. Then it is we destroy them utterly. The ultimate warning before destruction. And turning to the Green Book, one of our sources throughout this webinar, before jihad, issue an invitation, and if it doesn't work, Get non-believers to submit to Sharia and pay special tax in exchange for their life. This is extortion Islamic style. Think of Islamization as a transformative process that gradually changes the house of war into the house of Islam under Sharia law. And as we go through this process, remember the 1982 document, The Project, and one of the elements of the 12 point strategy for the Muslim Brotherhood to establish alliances with progressive organizations and form a red green axis. One of the first steps in this process is to remove non Islamic religious symbols and cultural traditions. We see this being played out today with attempts to remove Confederate monuments and statues and references to the founding fathers in the classroom. And by relabeling names, the names of religious days of significance, like Christmas, into neutral terms of political correctness, thus removing any competition that our original Judeo-Christian culture might present to Islam. For our peace officer viewers who are well versed in the broken windows theory of crime control, we can call Dawah the broken windows of our culture that will eventually lead to its total transformation unless Dawah is stopped. The next broken window is to start replacing what has been removed from our culture with increased levels of Sharia compliance all in public view. Note the number of, as one example, the change of swim periods for strictly Sharia compliance swim periods for Muslim women. Harvard gyms go to Sharia. North Carolina Aquatic Center says yes to Sharia. San Diego YMC enforces Sharia. Maryland pools try Sharia and separate swimming for women only. Minnesota YMC and St. Paul Police Department organize Sharia swim teams. George Washington University adds female-only swim hours for Muslims, and Oregon Muslim requests women-only time periods and female lifeguards. At my alma mater, a female Muslim applicant demanded that the uniform rules be changed be changed to adopt the head covering. California Catholic school removes statues to avoid offending Muslims.
by removing a statue of baby Jesus. The process of Dawa also targets Muslims as addressed in the explanatory memorandum. The first aspect is to stay united by avoiding assimilation. And the Muslim Brotherhood underscores the importance of mosques and Islamic centers as the axis of their movement. While admonishing its followers not to become anxious and become too quick by forcing pushback from the host nation population. And as we've seen, go public with the various attributes of the unique big tribe identity, obviously by going public, it symbolizes power. The power to make demands and extract special concessions, all showing there is nothing that can be done to stop the Islamization process. Muslim women are told to have many children, with the president of Turkey calling for five babies per female. And don't forget Muslims are told by the Muslim Brotherhood to play the victim card whenever possible, and to always follow fundamentalist beliefs of Salafi Islam. To review where we are, from the visuals we've seen in this webinar, we have some idea how Dawa is preparing the way for jihad. And it's because we fear jihad, we bend to the Muslim Brotherhood's demands, while the lulls and the actions seduce us that all is well, even though it's only temporary. Yosef R. Kawadawi has something to say about Dawa. But first, let's get reacquainted with him. He has been a follower of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan Bana, since his youth in Egypt. He is considered a spiritual guide for Hamas and a leader of the global Muslim Brotherhood movement, even though he refused to take on this task formally. And he is a worldwide following on his Al Jazeera TV program of 60 million people. In November 2011, Kawadawi delivered an address in America about Dawa, calling on all Muslims to embrace Dawa as practiced by Muhammad, while the Muslim Brotherhood was to remain decentralized in all Western countries following the overall Muslim Brotherhood strategy outlined in the project. And as we've seen, infiltrate all entities of society by temporarily cooperating with non-Muslims, remember deception and continuing to support jihadist groups, but avoid direct confrontation with local authorities. It's now game on to make us capitulate without firing a shot through insurgency. To eliminate America as prescribed in the explanatory memorandum. For those in our audience who are familiar with the doctrine of social Marxism, you might recognize the similarities between the Muslim Brotherhood strategy and the one originally authored by Antonio Gramsci in early 1930s. Armed with this information about Dawa, we can now turn to the specific phases of the plan. Phase one, the vanguard this cadre of senior leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, they're here. Phase two, establish a network of front groups, all listed in an explanatory memorandum, they're here. Phase three, infiltrate all America's institutions, this is going on now. As we've seen, make Muslims demands for special privileges and protections ongoing that all lead to final confrontation. We can label the three pillars of Dawa or pre-jihad as censorship, recall the training purge, as disinformation or recall the Muslim Brotherhood's spin game, and by infiltration throughout all of our institutions. At least you think the Muslim Brotherhood is operating on the fringe of Islamic doctrine and has concocted some pacifist means to avoid armed conflict for its members Let's look at what a military officer of a Muslim country that is a nuclear power has to tell us about Dawa. The Quranic concept of war authored by Brigadier General S.K. Malik. 
The Quranic Concept of War was authored by a Pakistani general and published in 1979, as the title suggests. This is warfare fought according to the rules of Allah, as stated by Allah, to be practiced by Muslims. In other words, it is war fighting divinely ordered by God. It is pre-jihad, or preparation to make ready. Having already won the war of will, the opponent's faith is destroyed. The key to victory is the preparation stage. Against them, make ready. Again, referring to chapter 8, verse 60 of the Quran. The Muslim Brotherhood's network for Dawah, as constituted after the Muslim Student Association was established in 1963, and how it has morphed into a complex network today, and consists of thousands of entities, followers, sympathizers, and non-Muslim enablers, all operating on the same pages of the explanatory memorandum. As I said, phase one is done, and it started in 1963 with considerable funding from Saudi Arabia. It was no accident the Muslim Brotherhood put their initial foothold on our college and university campuses so that graduates of their programs could then infiltrate other institutions. Phase two, the network through front groups. By forming a virtual parallel society following Wahhabi brand that is virtually indistinguishable from Salafism practiced by the fundamentalists. Well, let's see what a parallel society looks like. Every major institution on the left that we're all familiar with has a Muslim Brotherhood counterpart. And there are more examples with their counterparts. Remember, many of the groups in the parallel society were originally identified in the explanatory memorandum and have been added since this, and many more have been added since its publishing. Adding more Muslims is a key component in order to change the culture. Recall the example of Muhammad who left a hostile area and made a pilgrimage or Isra, Hijra to a peaceful non-Muslim area in a Medina. So too today, Muslim refugees are told to remain isolated in enclaves, sometimes called rabats or outposts in the house of war for jihad. Speaking of birth rate, the president of Turkey Recep Erdogan tells Muslims it will bring victory. As for refugee resettlement, it too plays an important part. To be able to increase the visible indicators of Sharia compliance so that there are more voices demanding concessions, which leads to empowerment and political clout. So at first, Muslims are told, keep a low profile, becoming good neighbors. As their numbers grow, apply Sharia compliant measures within local areas, publicly condemn the jihadists, but not by name, and seek interfaith bridge building with other religions. Phase three is when the heat gets turned up and demands for concessions increase and lawfare or the filing of civil suits becomes more frequent to intimidate and silence critics. Confrontation means becoming bolder and more aggressive, not only because the Muslim population has grown, but because the red-green axis has solidified and become stronger. And the advocates of political correctness and multiculturalism, also known as useful idiots, join ranks. 
And finally, phase five is victory or total capitulation. One only has to look at Europe to see how all this has played out. But don't rely on mainstream media to include Fox to report any of this. But there are plenty of second or third tier media outlets that cover the takeover of Europe every day. And as we'll see, where there is social unrest in the US, you'll find jihadists, sympathizers, and activists like happened in Ferguson, Chicago, and Baltimore. We'll look more closely at Intifada in America during webinar number 10. Before we leave this evening's webinar, let's look at how we're being conditioned to accept more Sharia compliant practices. Such practices are highly visible locally and are designed that, that the fundamentalists are making no attempt to assimilate in our culture. Mosques are being constructed at a record pace with current number in excess of 3,000 nationwide. The majority have some financial link to Saudi Arabia and are also affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. And as we'll see in webinar number 11 on mosques, over 80% promote violence in addition to other Sharia crimes in America. We've already addressed how Sharia dress codes for Muslim women are becoming more common and foot baths are being installed in public places, especially our transportation hubs. And more and more Muslims are demanding to pray in large numbers in public spaces, even if traffic during rush hour has to be rerouted. Quiet spaces in many public buildings, once open to anyone desiring a place to mediate or meditate or pray are being converted to Muslim male only prayer rooms. Then there was the demand several years ago by Muslims to convert the National Cathedral into a mosque for Friday prayers. And if you shop at Target, you might see a sign such as this at a checkout counter directing you to another line because the Muslim employee can't handle, handle pork or alcohol products. Then there was the conversion of the Oklahoma State Capitol building into a mosque again for prayer. More and more public schools are adding Muslim holidays to their calendars all for all students to observe. While local city councils pass resolutions against any speech offensive to Muslims, and following the Chattanooga jihadist attack that killed four Marines and one sailor, the Empire State Building in New York celebrated the end of Ramadan by illuminating the building in green while showing no support for the victims' families of the tax. And foot baths continue to be constructed, some more elaborate than others, this one at Orlando International Airport. Another example of public prayers blocking vehicles and pedestrian traffic, this time in Los Angeles. At the fort, at the post exchange at Fort Carson, Colorado, a vendor was prohibited from selling this t-shirt honoring 9-11 because it was considered offensive to Muslims. And then there's Hamtramck, Michigan. Near Dearborn and Detroit is now ruled by Muslim elected officials and is solely being converted from a Polish to a Muslim city with a public call to prayers five times a day. And not far away, one of the largest mosques in America. So how deep is their control in the United States? None of this would not be for happening if it wasn't for the Muslim Brotherhood and their virtual control of all Muslim groups in America by Muslim Brotherhood leaders with some females to give a softer image. Non-Muslim Brotherhood groups are marginalized and often condemned for apostate, as apostates to neutralize their influence. So this concludes our webinar 
about the Muslim Brotherhood tonight. Our major topics for next week's seventh webinar is to examine the common characteristics of Muslim Brotherhood front groups, to take a closer look at CARE and its close association with the FBI and how it influences local law enforcement, to take a look at its penetration into government and educational institutions, and the infiltration of Sharia into our legal system. I'll now turn the webinar over to Mary, who will handle your questions and answers. And good evening, everybody. Thank you for the- Good evening, uh, everybody. Thanks for attending tonight. And uh, David, does, I tell you, you know, I've known David for many years and uh, Every time I watch one of these and uh, hear his presentations, and I've taken his two-day class, um, I still learn stuff. I still learn a lot. Um, there's so much here that uh, the detail on it is amazing, David. Thank you for that. Oh, and I'm just happy that uh, I didn't lose power. I'm in the southeast, and uh, we've got a storm going on here, so forgive me for that. Um, anyways, let's kick this off. I want to make sure that everybody, anybody that's new to this, um, is able to uh, go to some of the previous ones that we've had. Uh, obviously, this is our sixth one, so please check us out on the unitedwest.org slash Sharia Crime Stoppers, not as easy to say, um, for our um, previous ones or even on YouTube. We have a Sharia Crime Stoppers YouTube page as well. So they're all previous ones, and this one will be out there within 24 hours. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands we're still open to questions. If you want to send us a note on Spearpoint911 at shariacrimestoppers.org to tell us what's going on in your area. And one last thing I want to say before we get into the Q&A is that something we have failed to say to all of you is that David actually does this class on site. He has been doing it for over four years and has trained over 1,500 police officers and sheriffs. And he's been doing it with, um, with the presentation that basically he's been doing for the 16-week program in a two-day event. So just to let you know, David uh, continues to try and do this um, to any officer, any uh, local officers or um, sheriffs that will let him come in. Uh, basically, it's free, but uh, he needs uh, to have his expenses paid for is all the cost to it. So just FYI on that. Let's get to the questions, and we've got a few already lining up here. Let me get to them. So tonight, Chris wants to know, uh, it has been argued that the explanatory memorandum was written by low-level MB Muslim Brotherhood operatives, and there is no evidence it was adopted or implemented by Muslim Brotherhood leadership. How do you respond? Well, that's part of the deception. Uh, there's no question that this was authored and written and developed by the highest levels of the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States. It's never been repudiated by any of the senior leadership. It's still in effect and it's still being followed. Now, of course, they're gonna to wanna to try to deceive you that uh, it was written by low level individuals. This is part of the plan. And of course, we have others on the other side, the progressives, uh, people in, our, in the media, as well as college, universities, and campuses yes. that also have bought into this deception. But this is still on the table as their strategic plan to take over the United States, and they are still following it to this very day. Yes, they are. Um, we've got a question by Alan. We've talked about the Muslim Brotherhood being declared a foreign terrorist organization. Um, if they were designated as a foreign terrorist organization, would that include CARE, ISNA, MSA, and the others, or do they have to be declared individually s separate to the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, it all depends how the uh, Secretary of State puts together the document that declares the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization in the United States. If the document clearly says to include all of the Muslim Brotherhood entities 
and associates, then it would include specifically named organizations, and he would probably have to do that. Just like the Holy Land Foundation trial concluded with uh, 305 unindicted co-conspirators, that would be a good place to start to label the, the network that the Muslim Brotherhood has established here as part of the terrorist network that they have. Uh, Jeff would like you to explain the broken window reference that you made in terms of the law enforcement um, for those that are not law enforcement. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Jeff. Uh, the broken windows theory basically says that uh, in your local communities, if property homes are not properly maintained and taken care, care of, over time, they'll start to deteriorate. And over time, the first broken window will become visible for all people to see. And over time, if that's not repaired, then slowly but surely, there'll be another and another and another. And then finally, it will happen next door or down the street. And before long, you're going to have a situation where good people who can afford to start moving out because their property values start deteriorating. And other law-abiding citizens, usually the elderly or the poor who can't afford to move out or forced to remain, and a criminal, criminal element will eventually uh, enter the city or enter the area and engage in low-level activities such as drugs, narcotics, and what have you, gain activity, harassment of females outside of a local store or what have you, and then slowly but surely it gets worse and worse and worse. Law enforcement is at first called in to try to handle it, but after a while they get discouraged because they think nobody in the community really cares either. So they stop caring. So this is basically an evolutionary process that the first indicator has to be dealt with. And that's the analogy I was trying to paint with this uh, theory is that now we see the first indicators of the Islamization of our culture. Slowly but surely, and it is getting worse and worse in many areas, some far worse than other areas, but nonetheless, it is starting to creep in to the culture and they're taking over. And they'll, they'll be making more and more demands or more and more broken windows will become evident to everybody as they already are in many sections of the country. Okay, we've got one from Donna. Uh, sounds like they are already well established in America and meeting many of their goals. How much time do we have left? And is there any way we can undo what they've accomplished? Remove their seditionists and get back to the America we know and love? If so, how? Well, the short answer is, do we have the political will to do it? A lot of this is gonna to have to come from Washington to disband this network and to attack it. We're gonna to have to get an attorney general in place who takes this matter seriously, and he's gonna to have to direct his subordinate assistant U.S. attorneys throughout the country to take this task on. Unless that happens, there are no legal remedies that are gonna be executed for this, and it's gonna be up to local jurisdictions. Now, at the local level, keep in mind that all of the demands that I showed you tonight, the, the visuals of how what's going on in local levels, were approved by local non-Muslim government officials. For example, public prayer blocking our roadways. Permission was granted by a local elected official to do that. Hmm. The law enforcement went along with it. So until that changes, until local yep. government elected officials feel pressure from their constituents not to bow to the pressure, the pressure will continue. Next week, next week, we'll have an opportunity to see how school boards are being impacted, how the curriculum on our secondary schools are, is being uh, affected. That's all controlled locally. So there's a lot of things that can be done on the local level if we just work to do it. Yeah, agreed. The bottom line is we've got a lot on our plate. There's no question about it. And it's what battle you want to fight. Yeah. And that's why we do what we do, to try and get the communities to wake up. So we've got one from Sharon. Earlier, you mentioned Muslim Brotherhood infiltration into the non-Muslim groups. 
Can you give one or two examples of these non-Muslim groups? Well, the non-Muslim groups, uh, the infiltration into our government is the one that uh, immediately comes to my mind that we talked about that resulted in the purge. Uh, the previous administration hired many Muslim Brotherhood representatives and placed them at the highest level of Department of Homeland Security. When the pressure came to the United States government to purge out law enforcement training, at the Department of Justice, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the military, these Muslims in the Department of Homeland Security we poor, were poised, ready, and they developed the countering violent extremism uh, concept of dealing with terrorism, which clearly showed there was no nexus between terrorism and Islam. And that's basically been on the table since 2011 when the last counterterrorism plan for the United States government was authored. Uh, what everyone needs to know is just this week, this past week, our government finally has come out with a revised plan and clearly labels the Islamic ideology as the principal driver behind jihadist terrorism for the United States. Now, this is a huge change because now our government has gone on record formally to name the threat. The threat that, if you remember, Sun Tzu says we have to know, have to understand if we're going to be victorious. Yep. Now we have a name. Now we're going to just have to get people trained up on it at the federal, state, and local levels on how to recognize it and deal with it. Okay, we got a question from Carl. How does the Gulenist movement play into and contribute to the civilization jihad? I'm sorry, Mary. Uh, repeat the name of the movement. Gulenist, the uh, Gulenist, the uh, jihadi camps, the Gulen movement. G U L E N. Oh, oh Gulan. Gulan, sorry. Gulenist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they have a network of schools in some states. Uh, it's a Turkish-run organization that uh, some feel has uh, greatly changed the uh, education uh, curriculum that these schools have. They're basically private, and, and non-Muslims are paying a lot of money to send their children there. They think they're going to get a good education. Uh, I would be very cautious before sending any child to a Gulan school uh, only because it's Muslim driven, uh, Islamic driven, and they've got an agenda that they are going to push one way or the other. And they're starting to do it at a very young level, young age with our children, the children in these schools as well as our public schools, because uh, that generation will grow up and they will be more accepting of the threat. Yeah. One last question and then we'll close this out. Uh, Patty wants to know, does the Muslim bro Brotherhood leadership get along? Are there power battles amongst various ones to have control? Is there one that seems to emerge as ruler over all of the groups here in the US? Well, I'm sure they have their differences. Uh, I certainly don't know of anything that has come out to the public. Uh, one thing that I want to make sure that you understand about their leadership, they have governing boards in all of these organizations. And their leadership serves on multiple boards. So you might have find the same faces on multiple boards, leading them, driving them, motivating them, inspiring them. So they are cross-fertilized, cross-integrated between one group and to another. The same personalities appear in multiple organizations, both males and females. And so whether or not they get along or not, I'm not sure, but they are all reading off of the same playbook. And that is that explanatory memorandum in the five-phase plan that we just got into tonight. Okay, thank you. All right, that's the last of the questions. I'm going to... Um 
talk a little bit about the uh, new endeavor that we've got going is the Sharia Crime Stoppers Action Line. We talked a little bit about it last week, and uh, we actually had our first show last Friday. And this one is on the Global Patriot Radio Network, and they, they actually have um, one show per day, so every day of the week. And the best way to probably find us is just go out and Google Global Patriot Radio, and you will see the link showing right here from your computer. You can reach us, blogtalkradio.com, Global Patriot Radio. We're on every Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and there's a couple other things you need to know to join us. You can call this number showing on the screen, the 319 number, um, just to listen. If you're out driving or out doing some other business, you can just listen to the show by calling that at 7 o'clock on Fridays. Or if you want to join in the conversation and speak to us, you can always um, call the number and press 1 to let us know. That gives us an indicator that on your number that uh, you want to actually come into the conversation and ask a question or just tell us what's going on in your area. So please join us on Friday nights. Also, if you missed Friday or cannot be there on a Friday night to join us, we've always got them in uh, podcast form that is showing, shown up on the Global Patriot Radio on demand area. So please join us and uh, it's a great way to learn what's going on. Basically what we're doing is we are going to bring you national security experts, former law enforcement officers, former Muslims and Christians who have experienced living under Sharia. Now, I know you can read that as I'm reading it off to you, but this is key because this, this radio show is, we're trying to design it so that it is an action-oriented program. We don't want to be just reporting what's happening in the communities. We want this to be an educational source. We want this to be a conversation with what's happening to everyone in their communities. We want it to be uh, the kind of show that identifies results and opportunities and activities that we can take on and do ourselves. And some of that means that you need to understand what the indicators are. David has been training us to do that. Over the past uh, few webinars that we've been doing, one of the key examples was the uh, Fort Hood. Look at all the indicators there, and they ignored them. If we had these indicators front and center with the folks that understood and were responsible, or if they understood it, the ones that were responsible to take the steps necessary to stop it, what would that outcome had been? it surely probably would have been a whole lot better than it ended up. Look at the Ford Hood again. So that's what this radio program is about. We hope you'll join us. And uh, that's basically the mechanics on what we're trying to do with Sharia Crime Stoppers Action Line. I'm going to now turn this over to Dick to let him talk about uh, what's happening this Friday and tell us what, uh, what I may have missed in telling you about it. Dick, it's all yours. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I think you did a great job of covering uh, the detail. Uh, let's spend a moment continuing on the Sharia Crime Stoppers um, Action Network, the radio show. The radio show complements what David Boris is doing. And uh, we want to make an announcement that this Friday, well, let's review for a second. Some of you may know that last Friday we had Tom Trento speaking about Florida and the implications of the election in Florida. Again, we were honored to have Tom and then Laura Loomer joined us to talk about the uh, transformations going on underway in Minnesota with the Keith Ellison uh, election. Uh, we also had Chris Wright describing uh, his uh, responses and summaries of the webinars that David Boris has been doing. So a lot went on last week. Uh, this week we have, uh, we're very happy to say we're gonna continue a discussion looking at the indicators, the dots that people can connect and we have our guest is one of the foremost uh, dot connectors. That would be Leo Homan, who is, as you may know, a journalist who's done extensive work on and has written a book called Stealth Invasion. So next week, that is, I'm sorry, not next week, this Friday, seven o'clock, Leo Homan will begin a discussion that we're going to invite the audience to join in. The discussion will be about the indicators, the early indicators, the transformations that you see in your cities. When you see a covered woman, 
when you see halal meat, when you see um, uh, the resettlement numbers go up in your community, what are the things that, that, that uh, Leo has seen, put in his book, talks about all the time in his articles, and then ask you to enter in a phone call. Again, push one if you want to talk, and we'll get you on to discuss your findings, the indicators that you're seeing in your community. Uh, so we're grateful for the opportunity to bring people uh, to start those conversations Friday night at 7 o'clock. Next Tuesday night, the webinars continue. Again, we will be on webinar number seven next week, uh, more part two of the Muslim Brotherhood with David, and uh, we'll continue again right on through December 18th. Uh, Tuesday night is David Boris teaching. Friday night is the uh, radio program giving us an opportunity for more in-depth conversation with each other. So thank you for joining us tonight. We'll see you either on Friday, and, and we'll definitely want to see you next Tuesday night for continuation of the webinar series. Thank you very, very much. Good night.